Hello, good morning. And uh, welcome and thank you for joining us in another session of Breakfast at University of Malaya Health Life Webinar. My name is Dr. Tio Ying and welcome to the first session in October. So October has been designated a month of breast cancer awareness since the year 1990s. And today we have a row of very confident and attractive female panelists to share with us a very uh, close topic uh, now close to our hearts in the midst of the pandemic era. So our topic today is on the COVID-19 and the breast cancer. So is it really a setback or is in fact a reset? So with the tight SOPs and um, the COVID pandemic era, there are so many things in our life has been changed. So uh, what we deem as a normal uh, pre-COVID era has not been true nowadays. So this leads to increase in stress and anxiety among the patients, and also the dilemma among those potential breast cancer patients in their delaying of diagnosis versus the risk of getting viral infection. So are we indeed expecting a more advanced cancer patients in the next uh, near future? And would it lead to a very worse outcome? And the answer will soon be unveiled in the near future. So let's get the ball rolling. And for the first speaker, we have my dear colleague, Dr. Tame Z, who is a breast cancer, breast surgeon, and also a medical lecturer from the Department of Surgery, University of Malaya Medical Center. She has attained her um, medical degree from the University of Science of Malaysia, as well as the Masters of Surgery from University of Malaya. She has completed her fellowship in the University of Malaya, as well as several countries in Thailand, Taiwan, Italy, and Japan. Her special interest in, is in the breast oncoplastic surgery, as well as the enhanced recovery after surgery. She is very active in several publications and also teaching, and uh, she's also been very active in the social activities with our breast cancer survivors. So as an extra note, I would like to remind all the participants that we do have a question and answer chat box available at the bottom of this uh, chat box, the Zoom box. So please feel free to uh, write down your questions and we will try to answer it at the end of the session. So without further ado, we would like to invite the first speaker, Dr. Tame Z, to start the ball rolling. The floor is yours. Thank you. Just let me share my slide. Um... Thank you for joining us this morning. It is an honor for me to be able to share my view as a surgeon on the impact of COVID-19 on the breast cancer care in line with the pink October month of breast cancer awareness. This image is very, we are quite familiar with this image, which has haunted us for more than one year. The world has been turned upside down and it has been quite discouraging. But there are always two sides to a coin. Evidently, there was, there were, there was massive reduction <clears throat> in motor vehicle accident, and the world has become greener. For breast cancer, is COVID-19 a great setback? This article revealed that breast cancer survival has shifted for the better reflected by the, overall, by the improved overall survival between two time periods. If you look into the graph, the first graph, which is in pink, is between the time period of 1993 to 1997, whereas the second graph is in, the second line is blue, between the time frame of 1998 to 2002. There was an overall shift in overall survival, and it has improved by about 17% between these two time frames. But what has changed? Following on, this paper then confirmed that the stage of diagnosis is an independent prognostic factor. The table showed that stage zero to two has a very good overall five year overall survival that is more than that is almost reaching beyond 90%. Whereas stage three and four have only overall survival of 19 to 
Therefore, we want to diagnose cancer as early as possible because it greatly affects overall survival. Within this time frame, the overall survival has changed due to awareness program and aggressive screening and education programs amongst both healthcare workers and the public. After all that has been sold, the world is then again hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Several articles in JAMA and uh, presented in the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium in December 2020 showed that there is a shocking but not unexpected, unexpected data. In 2020, screening has reduced by 62% in the US and Europe. Breast cancer diagnosis has reduced by 52% within this time frame. Where have these patients gone? It has also been proven the, 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 the reduction in, screen, uh, in diagnosis has caused also a reduction in breast cancer surgery by up to 21%. And in US, if you look into that photo, just in, in March 2020, there was a 94% reduction in breast and cervical cancer screening. All this have caused an increase in 14% of later stage breast cancer. Therefore, it is likely that overall survival for breast cancer could have been affected. What is happening in Malaysia then, and um, in, in, in specific in UMMC? We have done an analysis of 100 breast cancer patients in UMMC, and we have compared data between the pre-pandemic and the, and the data during pandemic. As presented here, there was a more than two times prolonged in presentation interval. Presentation interval is taken as the time patient had symptoms to the time they first present to any clinic. And there is also a delay by almost two times diagnosis interval. And this diagnosis interval is time when the patient present to the clinic to the time a confirmed pathological diagnosis is made. So have we taken a reverse gear? What about the presentation trend in Malaysia? How are breast cancer presented during the pandemic? Is it different or is it the same? There were three categories of presentation of breast cancer in general. Breast lump. Patients presenting with breast lump, they were during the pandemic compared to pre-pandemic, is higher, 98%. Does it mean that the disease has progressed? And does it mean that the tumor size has increased before they seek medical attention? There is also another category where patients present with non-breast lump symptoms. So more than double has come with presenting complaints of skin changes, skin ulceration, or even nipple discharge. And the most scary ones, are the, the ones that present with metastatic symptoms. There are threefold increase in the ones presenting to UMMC with metastatic symptoms. And does this mean that there is, uh, then this means that there is reduced overall survival because they are stage four. And from the graph that I presented just now, the, the overall survival for this patient is around 20%. So are these all because of gross reduction in screening or irrational fear and anxiety? Will this then lead to later stage diagnosis and are we mirroring the West? Treatment wise, has this pandemic affected our treatment? Treatment interval has amazingly reduced from 21 days to 18 days during the pandemic. At face value, this may sound good, but is it really true? It is most likely because there were less patients attending clinic due to possibly they attributed to worsening denial or there were barriers in coming to the hospital because of restriction, movement restrictions. What does then all this translate to? The cancer intervention and surveilling 
surveillance model uh, in US assessed, projected the delay, the impact of delay by more than six months. And this is taken in year 2020. And they have predicted by 2030, there will be excess death from breast cancer and 950 will be related to reduced screening, 1,300 associated with delayed diagnosis, 150 is related to reduced cytotoxic chemotherapy. Therefore, breast cancer, these impacts could be doubled if the pandemic effects are extended to more than a year. Is there? This pictogram is meaningful and says a lot. There may not be a light at the end of the tunnel, but there is always you, and you can be the light. Hence, it is timely to take action, to take a chance to reset. Things change. This is an opportunity to rethink, re-evaluate, and revamp. We want early diagnosis and quality health care. We want, we need logistic and cooperation. We achieve through digital transformation, improve overall hygiene, and most importantly, cooperation and compassion from every, every stakeholder. Vaccination has affected timing of several things in terms of breast cancer care, imaging and surgery. The Moderna trial um, in, presented in the US CDC in 2021 showed that there are 8 to 16% patients present with lymph adenopathy within two to four days after vaccination. And it is recommended that screening imaging be done four to six weeks after vaccination. And for diagnostic purposes, it should not be delayed. And patients who are cancer survivors, vaccine is recommended to be administered in the opposite arm. And in short-term follow-up, ultrasound in two to three months is recommended to confirm resolution of lymph adenopathy. The American Society of Anesthesiology in 2021 recommended that for surgery, elective surgery, at least one week of vaccination. And for those patients who have been diagnosed with COVID and they were, this, they were split into no or mild symptoms, and it is recommended to wait at least four weeks for elective surgery. And those with severe or prior ICU admission due to COVID to wait at least six to 12 weeks. These are in order to reduce post-operative complication as COVID is a multi-organ disease. So in breast clinic, we have adapted new strategy for diagnostic. We advocate one stop. So patients will come to visit breast clinic on the same day they will receive mammogram, ultrasound, and if possible, biopsy too. So despite uh, multi, uh, various stages of uh, movement uh, restriction orders, redistribution of manpower to, to help out with the COVID duties, our clinic service has been adjusted according to priority. Uh, of the disease. We have looked through patients and given reappointment and practice standard operating procedures. So amazingly, within uh, this one year, in, from July 2020 to June 2021, we were still able to, to maintain our service, although reduced, and service 8, 000, almost 9,000 patients within that one year during the multiple stages of MCO. And our breast care uh, services continue, and uh, we were able to offer our services to about 1,200 patients. We will also advocate for teleconsultation, which hopefully will, will, will start soon. And we have, most importantly, resumed screening. And for surgery, they will reduce <laughs> operation lists. We have about two lists per month during the critical. Uh, Time frame, and there were re reduction in ward beds and supporting services. What have we done? So we have prioritized cases according to low, medium, and high risk. Offered delayed reconstruction, and we have outsourced 
some of the patients for their surgery in the private sector covered by government funds. Surgery date has been adjusted. Elective surgery with patients uh, have to wait one week after vaccination. Pre-op COVID swap and quarantine surgery with face shield and N95 masks. We have also strongly advocate intraoperative radiotherapy for patients, for selective patients. Therefore, COVID-19 should not set us back. We should be agile and reset. Once again, you are the beacon of the light. So I just want to show that, uh, to invite everyone to join us in our nursing workshop next Monday. Again, you are the light. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tay, for a wonderful speech. So it's actually quite a worrying figure that you have presented on the increasing percentage in the metastatic breast cancer. So are we actually um, leading to an era where surgeons are uh, at the least important and actually oncologists are the one that will be seeing more and more patients? So actually next up, uh, we will be hearing from our clinical oncologist, a very senior oncologist in uh, our clinical oncology department regarding the treatment for the patients, whether it's still the same pre-COVID and currently. So for that reason, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Anita Zarina Bussam, who is our consultant clinical oncology from the Department of Clinical Oncology, Faculty of Malay um, Medicine, University of Malaya Medical Center. So she, she is um, a very famous and also renowned um, oncologist who has been involved in multiple international projects as coordinators and she has obtained her undergraduate degree from the University of Wales College of Medicine in Cardiff, as well as her FRCR um, from the London. And her area of expertise are in clinical oncology, which involves a lot of non-surgical treatment modalities for cancer patients, especially in the breast, lung, brain, lymphoproliferative, as well as pediatrics and skin. And her research interest in many clinical trials in solid tumors, particularly in the breast cancer. So she is currently actively involved in our intraoperative radiotherapy for breast cancer treatment, as well as involved in many international and industrial trials. So without further ado, let's uh, hear from our clinical oncologist, uh, Professor Dr. Anita, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Lee Ying. For the kind introduction, you, you made me feel very, very senior. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so let me just share my screen to begin with. Okay, so now um, I'm just going to talk about on the, the same topic, you know, COVID-19 breast cancer, whether it's a setback or reset, and mainly from the uh, oncology perspective. And thank you, Meza, the first speaker who's uh, set a very, uh, you know, for setting the scene. And certainly we all know for any cancer, it is the multidisciplinary approach in terms of treatment and no doubt, uh, you know, whether or not uh, you're actually in oncology and surgery, in radiology, our job actually affects, uh, you know, uh, each other. We have to work together for patients' care. So whatever happens in surgery, uh, well, again, uh, the impact will be in our oncology. Now, I'm just going to just go through, I think, I'm, I think you've all seen this, um, you know, on the internet and you've, you've, you've been around to, to the shops or whatever, you have seen all these posters. So these are the things that we know about, you know, COVID-19. So when it struck us last year, and I think it was 18th of March last year when the uh, MCO was announced in Malaysia. And you can see all these things everywhere, you know, how COVID-19 spread and, and who are the people, you know, with a higher risk of getting COVID-19. And you can see there on the screen. Um, and one of the uh, um, morbidities that's been associated with high risk of getting COVID-19 are patients with cancers. So of course, there's, you know, concerns there. I mean, of course, there are diseases which is much more 
common than cancers like diabetes, hypertension, you know, heart diseases, for example. So not, not to forget that these uh, people with these comorbidities also have, you know, quite high risk of COVID-19 infection. And we do know that, you know, COVID-19 in terms of uh, the uh, clinical features, you can have mild features. And and you can have, you know, um, quite severe features. And the problem with the mild features, people can go around without having symptoms that they don't know they've got COVID-19 and they may actually pass it on to others. So this is one of the problems that we have with COVID-19. And knowing that, you know, how it spreads, then we, we sort of like have some idea, okay, things we know we can do to minimize infection. So these are the three Ws. And I remember our Tansri uh, DG at the time, you know, keep hopping on on the three W's, wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. So um, so everyone will thought this, kids in schools were, were taught this, mask, wash hands, distance. And these are the general safety measures. And again, um, how do you watch your distance? And you, you know, the only way to do that is, to do that is by reducing uh, crowding. And, and as far as we are concerned, the hospital, how do we reduce crowding? And uh, inevitably, we will have to reduce the hospital visits and uh, hospitalization for the patients. We have to reduce physical contact. Now, in trying to actually reduce the risk of COVID-19 infection, not just to our patients, but also to the healthcare workers, um, there, there's always concern. Are we actually risking you know, our patients into having suboptimal cancer treatment. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to sort of like, okay, surely if you actually have to reduce visits, you have to reduce physical contact, there might be some examinations where you wouldn't really do as much on a patient. You, you will just rely on uh, imaging, for example. So, I mean, certainly, you know, it, it surely it has some impact on treatment. Now, just uh, as a follow-up to the previous slide, so like I've said just now, you know, uh, it, it's a no-brainer really. Once you actually reduce uh, visits, then the appointment gets longer for patients to come to hospital. And there are patients who are, I mean, rightly so, they actually do not come because they are fearful of getting COVID. I mean, like hospital is a, you know, certainly it's a crowded place and there are ill people in the hospital and, and there are also patients in the hospital who have COVID-19 uh, infection. So people, uh, patients uh, from elsewhere wouldn't want to come for their appointments because of this. And uh, again, I think Dr. Mazie men mentioned about travel restrictions. And, and the, the only way around this, as, as I can see it, which is, um, you know, it's, it's not possible is is by building you know, 10 new cancer hospitals within you know, a few months or a few weeks, but that's not gonna happen. And, uh, and also we need the manpower and, and all that. So, uh, and in Malaysia, we do have a fairly unique situation whereby most of the cancer centers are actually within the big cities, and especially in Klang Valley, if talking about the public hospitals, I mean, really, I mean, like the only um, cancer facilities outside of Klang Valley would be one in Johor Bahru, one in Penang, one in Kuching, and one in Lika Sabah. And, and that's about it. Uh, unless you come, you know, to Klang Valley, you have to travel to Klang Valley, you would not really get um, cancer treatment if you are actually going to a public hospital. So, I mean, private is a bit different, but that's going to be quite costly. And... And also because of this, you know, logic tells us surely there are treatment interruption or delay and uh, delay in procedures, investigations, for example. And surely this, you know, could result in disease progression and therefore suboptimal treatment and patient monitoring. And, you know, logic, logically there should, you know, we, we will actually have uh, problems with uh, cure rates. There'll be reduction in cure rate. And, and also patients who have, uh, advanced cancer, for example, because they're not able to come to the hospital uh, as frequently and they're not monitored properly and their symptoms are not properly monitored and affecting disease control. Now, so what did we do? And I think we weren't the only ones who were doing this. I think it's worldwide. Uh, we look at our patients, okay? This is like, in you know, how do we prioritize which patients should actually uh, not miss the appointments? Which patients can we actually then defer their appointments? Now, for the male or the men, gentlemen among the audience, um, if you feel very underrepresented because there's only ladies in this uh, cartoon picture, no hard feelings. It's just that breast cancer is very uncommon, um, 
in men. So you'd be glad to know that. So I think of all breast cancers, only about 1% are actually, you know, in, in men. In my 25 years, almost 30 years in oncology, I've probably seen about a handful of, you know, patients, male patients with uh, breast cancer. Anyhow, so we have a spectrum of patients. We have patients who are on chemotherapy. We have patients who are just about to start their treatment. And we have patients who just come into the hospital to go for some tests, uh, scans, mammogram, what have you. And we have patients who have symptoms, they have pain. So they're coming to see the doctor for, for their pain. And patients who are just on regular checkups. These are patients who are um, actually disease-free or rather the cancer is in remission. So just coming for routine checkups. So, so when we have this spectrum of patients, then we will tell ourselves, okay, those on chemotherapy can't wait. Regardless, we have to make sure they get the treatment. And then those who are starting treatment. So, so de again, depending on the situation, some treatment you can actually delay or defer without actually compromising on the uh, cure rate. So then we'll say, okay, these patients, in, in order to reduce the crowd at the uh, treatment area, then we will actually reschedule the treatment. And again, patients going for some tests. So some tests are actually quite urgent. Some tests are just like routines, just a, in a regular checkup. Then again, you know, we could choose to delay that. Patients with symptoms, I mean, this, yes, we need to see these patients. If the patients are actually from elsewhere, then maybe we can contact uh, you know, the nearest uh, hospital, nearest doctor. We can call up the patient, okay, look, you have the symptoms, maybe you can go to this, you know, this nearest clinic, for example. So these are the things that we've had to do, uh, especially when, the, uh, when we first, uh, the lockdown started last year. Now, what about the uh, treatment itself, okay? And uh, we have had to sort of like modify certain, uh, certain treatments. Um, and again, this is actually done worldwide. And so as far as the patient is concerned, okay, you know, yes, I have to still come to the hospital. Doctor says I must continue treatment at the hospital. Uh, again, some can wait. And sometimes we change the uh, intravenous medication into oral medication, which patients can take at home. And there are situations where we can actually lengthen the uh, interval or sometimes even the treatment interval can be lengthened. And there are certain treatments that we can actually shorten. We do not need to give like, you know, uh, for example, as it happened during uh, this pandemic, there, have, there was some data uh, showing the radiotherapy for breast cancer patients, you could actually give it in a, a shorter um, overall duration compared to the typical three weeks, you know, or four weeks of treatment. So that has been very helpful. Now, um, for those um, clinicians who wish to actually look at some of the uh, recommendations on um, you know, which patients should be prioritized. I think, uh, I mean, there are many guidelines out there, but I thought ISMO guidelines is actually quite comprehensive and uh, it, it's not just on the uh, um, anti-cancer treatment as in chemotherapy, but also it covers surgery, diagnostics, um, you know, screening and all that. I, th I thought this is a fairly good um, document if you wish to look it up. Now then, so coming back to things that we don't really know much about COVID-19 and breast cancer. So um, Mesa actually presented some data and I'm glad to see that we actually have some statistics at least from UMMs itself. So, you know, what's the impact on the disease and an impact of, you know, late diagnosis and then stage migration, meaning to say that patients who would otherwise have been detected with early stage cancer has now coming with you know, more advanced uh, cancer. And then what's the impact on treatment, the timeliness of treatment? Are we giving it on time? Are we giving it you know, at the um, correctly, regularly, um, effectively? What about treatment pattern? You know, the type of treatment, the sequence of treatment, uh, whether we do, uh, when before me, there are patients who we would normally do surgery first. Now we are not able to do surgery first because there's you know, lack of uh, OT, time and our intensivists and anesthetists are actually busy looking after COVID-19 patients so that we actually have to modify the way the way we work. What about treatment modification? What about, you know, uh, there were situations that we had to actually 
um, reduce the uh, doses of a chemotherapy because we do not want patients to have risk of uh, uh, neutropenia or neut uh, neutropenic sepsis and whereby they will require hospital admission and also put them at risk of you know, infection. So, so these are the things that we, we have had to do, but how does it impact patient? I mean, we know surely it will impact patient, but how much? And that, that bit is not very clear yet to us. So it will take time to actually collect the data and to actually do the analysis. Now, again, not all patients with cancer, not all patients with breast cancer are the same. So which group of patients has a higher risk of worse outcome from the cancer? Again, this is another question. And, and of course, uh, how to restore confidence in patients, you know, into coming to the hospital to, to have treatment. And the fear is that, you know, do cancer patients have worse symptoms if they get COVID? And do cancer patients have a higher risk of death? if they get COVID? Is there a difference in risk between cancer survivors versus those newly diagnosed and, and those on, um, on treatment at the moment? So now these are some of the articles that I found in the uh, literature. They, they are fairly uh, reputable uh, journals. This is uh, to, to look at the time to treatmentization for breast cancer during the uh, 2020 pandemic. So this is actually done by a group in, in America. So they looked at, uh, what they did was they looked at patients who were diagnosed with early stage breast cancer from January to May last year. And they compared uh, this uh, cohort of patients with those from, um, historical you know, uh, data, those who were, who were diagnosed in 2018, um, January 2018 to, January, uh, to May 2015, exact the same date. So what they did was they looked at the uh, patient volume, the time to treatmentization, and the initial treatment modality. So what they found, you can see down there in the conclusion, uh, TTI, which is the time to treatmentization, was maintained. So again, I think Maisie just now pointed out that uh, it appears as though, you know, the uh, uh, treatment interval, I think, I think Maisie meant the time to treatmentization seemed to have reduced in UMMC during the uh, you know, pandemic. But again, you know, there are various reasons for that. So, but interestingly, this study, you know, sort of like showed similar um, findings, which is you know, maintained among patients diagnosed and treated for breast cancer during the uh, pandemic. Um, and again, I suspect the decrease in patient volume because you know, they were actually seeing less patients scheduling the patient. And then specifically in patients with in situ disease. In situ just means it's very, very early pre-cancerous stage. So meaning you are seeing less patients with very, very early breast cancer. So this is something that Yes, we kind of like, you know, suspect this, this will happen, but now it's, it's sort of like been shown in, in this study. And there's a shift in initial therapy towards the use of preoperative hormonal therapy. Again, why hormonal therapy? Because, you know, that's the least toxic. That's something that patient can take at home by themselves. So uh, that seems to be the most practical thing to do. Now, that's one study. So again, I look at another study. This is in the, in the Netherlands. Again, very, very similar uh, study design. So they looked at patients uh, during the pandemic, uh, weeks two to 17 of 2020. They compared it with reference data from 2018, 2019, very, very similar to the previous study. And again, very similar findings, incidence declined across all age groups and tumor stages. So, and particularly for DCIs, again, it's the same thing with the ductal carcinoma in situ and stage one disease. So again, showing that same pattern, patients are being diagnosed at a later stage because those who are early stage were not detected because maybe they don't go for screening because of COVID-19, for example. And then the DCIS was less likely to be treated within three months. Invasive tumors were less likely to be treated initially by surgery. Chemo was less likely for tumors diagnosed in the beginning of study period. And then hormonal treatment was more common, again, similar to the other uh, study just now. Now, what about the concerns with regards, you know, do patients, cancer patients with COVID-19, do they uh, get worse uh, disease uh, when they get affected by COVID-19? And what about the uh, death rate? Uh, now, this is actually look at all patients with cancer. I mean, I couldn't find anything which looked specifically at breast cancer patients, because I think that's perhaps, you know, uh, 
to focus of a population. So it's just a general thing that we want to know. And this, again, uh, this is actually uh, published in JAMA Oncology. This is done in the United States. Um, they found they, from this study, 1,200 had cancer diagnosis, uh, and then 690 had a recent cancer diagnosis. So there are group, two groups of, groups of uh, population here. One are those who've had cancer, and then there's another smaller group who recently diagnosed with cancer. And they found that those with recent cancer diagnosis were, had an increased risk of uh, COVID-19 infection. And in particular, these are patients who've been diagnosed with leukemia, lymphoma, and lung cancer. I think it doesn't really come as a surprise because leukemia, lymphoma, again, they are, tend to be very immunosuppressed and the treatment tend to be very, very immunosuppressive. And patients with lung cancer, we know that people with uh, pre-existing uh, lung respiratory problem, they are at higher risk of uh, getting severe uh, COVID-19 infection and higher risk of uh, mortality from COVID-19. So they concluded that patients with cancer were significantly at increased risk of COVID-19 infection and worse outcomes. And in this study, they found that it's, this is further uh, exacerbated among African-Americans. Again, I think there's uh, socioeconomic issues there. Now, just this one other study, again, similar um, design. This is actually a population-based study from Norway. And um, although this study, interestingly, it did not show that patients who have uh, cancer actually at a higher risk of getting COVID-19 compared to those in the population who do not have cancer. But when they looked at patients who actually have cancer and when they get COVID-19, when they looked at the uh, combined outcome of death and or readmittance to the hospital. So if you actually have cancer and you get COVID and you have COVID-19, it seems that you know, they found there's a twofold increased risk of patients uh, diagnosed with cancer less than a year ago, meaning quite recently diagnosed. And then for those treated with anti-cancer drugs during the past three months and patients undergoing major surgery. So I think based on this, rightly so, um, you know, we did have to defer uh, you know, surgery for some patients. And we did have to sort of like, you know, um, do some modification for patients who are on anti-cancer uh, drugs. And we were obviously concerned, you know, what would be the impact. But I think it's all, a, you know, it's, it's a balance between risk of uh, dying from COVID-19 versus, you know, the uh, um, cancer uh, outcome. Now, coming back to the question, COVID-19 breast cancer setback or reset, I'd like to think of, you know, the setback, not quite a setback, I'd like to think of it as a challenge. And, uh, and, uh, and I, the reset, I'd like to think of it as not quite reset, because reset to me means go back to, you know, before, go back to normal. It's not going to be normal. So... But I think it's given us an opportunity to regroup and strategize our approach to cancer care. And, and we have, as a result of this pandemic, we have developed a lot of capacity for remote monitoring and we have empowered our patients you know, in a magnitude that we've not done before and because we just have to. So, so I think, yes, you know, there were challenges, but you know, we we have been able to actually come up with certain things that we never thought we we would have to and, and we could do. So 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 for those of you who are um, as you know as old as I am, <laughs> you remember the uh, Star Wars series, and you know this, I've got this the Empire Strikes Back. So you know when the tough gets going, the going gets tough. So with that, I'd like to end. Um, my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Anita, for a very enlightening talk. And uh, just to remind the audience, our question and answer chat box is still open for more questions, and we will try to answer that at the end of the session. So due to some unprecedented event, our last speaker, who is Ms. Ranjit uh, Kaur, would not be able to join us today for a sharing session uh, from the perspective of a breast cancer survivor. Okay, next up. So Prof. Anita has been talking about more and more advanced diseases coming in. But as advocates of breast cancer awareness, 
the team of surgeons are actually trying to catch those who are at their early stage of diagnosis. But is there a challenge to the screening protocol that we have all this while? So next up, we have our vibrant clinical radiologist, as well as the head of the Department of Biomedical Imaging, uh, to share with us actually her next topic on the perspective from the, the um, clinical radiologist. And we have Professor Dr. Katini Rahmat, who is a senior consultant clinical radiologist from the Department of Biomedical Imaging, Faculty of Medicine, UMMC. And uh, she's currently the head of unit um, of Department uh, Biomedical Imaging. And she has um, graduated from University of Malaya uh, and also at, uh, obtained her FRCR and also Masters of Radiology, and that is from University of Malaya, and she did her fellowship in the Royal Perth Hospital. And she's a member of many, many renowned international and also national societies. And her area of expertise includes breast cancer imaging, and as well as diagnostic neuroradiology, and also MRI and CD scans of the breast, so uh, MRI of the breast. So she's involved in many, many um, researches and also um, projects. And I think um, the, uh, I will just pass on this uh, session to Prof Katini to share with us her view on um, imaging during the COVID era. The floor is yours. Sorry, thank you so much for the kind introductions, uh, Dr. Tio Ying. I would like to share my screen now. Okay, shucks, I'm having trouble again. Hang on. Waiting for Prof. Katini. I'm sure that you have a lot of burning questions. And uh, at this moment, I am actually seeing 117 participants who join us for our breakfast session today. So thank you very much for joining us. And we do actually have one question in a chat box, but we will tackle with, with it in a short while. I think the question is directed to Prof. Katini, so we shall wait for that um, after her session. All right, while well, waiting for Prof. Katini, uh, maybe just a question to either Dr. Te, uh, maybe Professor Anita could actually answer, because we do get a lot of patients who come into clinic asking us of whether is it safe to get the vaccination, um, especially those who had just completed their chemotherapy, um, or maybe those with a breast cancer um, with some guided prognosis. So any view on that, um, Dr. T or Prof. Anita? Hi, thank, thank you for the question. Um, as of now, I don't think there is any direct comparison between vaccines. Therefore, it is actually not clear if any is safer or any is safer or even more effective than the others. However, all have showed that the vaccines are effective at both reducing the risk of uh, getting the infection or increase severity, reduce the severity if they get infected. Therefore, most medical, most large medical organizations have not come with a recommendation of specific vaccines. Many believe that getting vaccines, once it becomes available to you, uh, whichever one is the most important, rather than waiting for a specific brand. Okay. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for the patience. Uh, um, I think uh, Dr. Mezi and Prof. Anita has uh, uh, succinctly and comprehensively uh, displayed uh, and presented uh, the real scenarios of uh, COVID real scenario uh, and the uh, environment of uh, COVID era uh, in terms of uh, clinical treatment as well as uh, our health uh, practices. Anyway, um, since in lieu of the limited time, I, will, I would like to talk about uh, specifically on uh, post-COVID-19 vaccination uh, features on breast imaging. So this is a uh, I think this is quite important because we get we get referrals and we get questions and queries all the time about uh, when to do the imaging, why do we still carry on with the uh, screening, uh, do we have to delay the uh, appointments or and deal with uh, some of the uh, implications of the COVID nineteen vaccination. So breast cancer screening, I think uh, Dr. Mizi has uh, uh, 
uh, previously mentioned how the screening improved uh, uh, breast cancer survival and uh, improved the care of the patients as well as our practices. So the key word is early detection. Why we do screening? Because of early detection, it remains the primary way to prevent development of life-threatening breast cancer. Breast cancer screening do not treat uh, breast cancer, but it alleviates most of the uh, complications as well as uh, morbidity and mortality. So detected smaller breast cancer on breast screening, namely mammography or MRI, whenever feasible, are more treatable and thus improve outcome by treatment during the asymptomatic period. So less intensive therapy due to localized disease is what we want, what the clinicians want, what the, all the health providers want. And mammography is the only gold standard that can show abnormality in breast cancer screening. So usually it is present, whatever findings that we see on uh, mammography screening one or two years before they are clinically palpable. We know that when they are clinically palpable, they are usually more than two centimeters. When it's more than two centimeters, we know that we are dealing with an either invasive cancer or a stage two higher cancers. This is our clinical practice guidelines that has uh, recently been uh, updated. So this is a 2020 guideline. Uh, we have uh, classified them to women of average risk, moderate risk, and those of high risk uh, populations. So we stick to the uh, Malaysian guidelines, although other uh, national, international guidelines uh, uh, have advocated uh, screening uh, above 40 or 45, but we start if they have average risk, don't worry about this uh, risk. These are all uh, determined by your healthcare providers. We don't decide whether you have a uh, your own uh, risk or moderate or high risk. It depends on your age, depends on your family he, family risk factors, depends on whether you have any previous uh, uh, surgical or uh, namely breast uh, pathologies. So between age to 50 to 75, we don't stop at 75 namely, but they say that uh, screening works best if you uh, we uh, do screening at least 10 times in our lifetime. So we take that as if it's once in every two years, so we stop at 75 because, uh, stop at 75, why 75? Because uh, I, most, uh, most of the guidelines have provided that uh, we need at least 10 years of uh, 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 lifespan for all the treatment to be uh, effective, right? So moderate risk starts earlier and you see the high risk, these are women with uh, genetic, uh, uh, genetic uh, mutation carriers like BRCA, TP53, PALB2, these are, they will start earlier at age 30. Even those uh, patients with uh, leukemia or uh, lymphoma who has uh, previous radio, radio uh, uh, radiation therapy to the chest wall, they are at a higher risk of getting breast cancer. So we start them early. Uh, it can be started with mammography or MRI whenever it's feasible. So the breast cancer screening is a secondary prevention, it's not a primary prevention. The aim is to detect early breast cancer and the only in healthy women. So we want to see asymptomatic. So sometimes, even though you think you are asymptomatic, you have to see a, a clinician. Uh, you can go to the uh, uh, assessment center, you can go to the uh, primary care center because uh, the either a health provider or the clinicians may examine and find out that, that you have any other clinical presentation. So it may not be asymptomatic, but to you, you should go for the screening based on the uh, timeline that I have uh, projected earlier. So you see here, this is a mammography, it's just an X-ray of 2D uh, images. The radiation is very low, it's less than, uh, it's less, uh, the radiation is much, much less than exposure when you fly from uh, Malaysia to America. So this is only done once in two years, so don't be afraid. You're not going to be burned or irradiated. So we have now a, uh, this is a 2D, uh, this is a conventional, uh, in PPUM, we have uh, done uh, a quasi 3D mammography, which is a tomosynthesis. So people like the word tomosynthesis everywhere they go. I want to have a tomosynthesis. It's nothing great, but we have uh, better imaging for those young women and with dense breasts. What is dense breasts? Dense breasts, when we say there's so many whites on the x-ray and it's difficult for us to detect cancer. So you see here, there's a speculated star here, mass. This is a small cancer that we're looking for, baby cancers. So when the women are dense or uh, very young, we have very uh, many white uh, feet, very many white uh, uh, dots on the breast that could mask or obscure the 
uh, cancer that we want to uh, identify. That is a um, screening mammogram. See, this is a 2D uh, CC and MLO view. So this takes about 15 minutes tops uh, examination, but uh, preparation. So before COVID era, that was uh, prior to March 2019, it takes you about, well, probably because the, the queue is very long. So maybe you have to stay one or two hours in the, in the radiology area, but because of the uh, MCO and the movement control order, uh, the screening and the uh, diagnostic uh, mammography uh, uh, appointments have been uh, markedly or, or significantly reduced. So instead of doing yearly, we have 5,000 mammography examinations a year. We have cut down to maybe about 2,000 to 3,000, and we only um, uh, prioritize those with uh, symptoms. But uh, hopefully we will be back to uh, business uh, after October when the restriction control movement disorder uh, order, uh, gets uh, uh, updated. So hopefully we will receive our, our uh, usual uh, mammography screening from then on. So anyway, talk about uh, because of the vaccine, uh, the rollout started in April uh, 2021 this year. So there has been about April, May, June, July, and until now, October, about six months of active uh, vaccination rollout. Now we've started doing the uh, uh, adolescents and, you know, we have uh, 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 girls uh, of 12 to uh, 16 years of age, uh, they can have uh, similar problems. So we talk about post-vaccine adenopathy. This is uh, not common, but it, it is uh, not in Malaysia, but it's very common in US and, and some European country who utilizes this Moderna or mRNA vaccine. Because we use a Pfizer uh, vaccine, most of the Pfizer vaccine also have about up to 11% uh, incidence of this post-vaccine uh, post adenopathy. So what is this uh, post-vaccine adenopathy? This is uh, specific to uh, COVID-19 vaccination. It's an enlargement of the lymph nodes under the um, underarm or anywhere there's a vaccination uh, jab uh, because of the immune system reaction associated with the vaccines. So the most common incidence occurs in Moderna vaccine followed by Pfizer. Uh, I have yet to encounter any uh, patients or women who had received uh, AstraZeneca or Sinovac with uh, ex lymphadenopathy. And we received these uh, uh, women with this uh, uh, axillary swelling uh, not just in a uh, breast unit, but also in other uh, radiology areas like CT scan, PET scan, and MRI. But uh, as long as we know, uh, we encourage uh, women to inform us before they uh, come in for the procedure, whether they had the, uh, when the first or second dose of vaccination and when it was done and on which side of the arm. Sometimes they do on the le uh, left side and sometimes they do on the right side. So this is very important because some patients have cancer uh, previously and we need to know that this uh, adenopathy is, uh, is not uh, concerning. So the swelling typically subsides within a few weeks. So we take about, I think there have been so many papers and publications that say up to six weeks is, uh, this is a natural occurrence. Uh, some women do get it prolonged up to three to six months, but as long as they are asymptomatic, uh, they don't have any other features like uh, breast or any other neck swelling, then it should be all right and they shouldn't be referred for imaging. So incidental A, uh, axillary lymph node or supraclavicular uh, because it, the injection is on the upper arm deltoid, so lymphadenopathy can occur whether in the underarm or in the, uh, in the neck area. So this may be concerning and it may be mistaken as a sign of cancer for routine imaging such as uh, mammography, ultrasound, MRI, and PET scan. So what is the implication to screening mammogram and ultrasound in our uh, respect? So radiology and breast imaging societies worldwide have recommended postponing routine mammograms and other imaging for at least six weeks after the final vaccine dose. But I have to say that in practice, this is very difficult for us because most of the women that come to UMMC comes from uh, uh, a distance away. And it's difficult for them to, to organize the uh, mammography according to the vaccination. And what is important is to get the vaccination first if you have no breast cancer or any other clinical, uh, uh, clinical uh, problems. This vaccine occurs, you know, like right now all the PPVs have closed up. So you need to go for your second dose uh, according to your appointments. Right, or you schedule the screening exam before receiving the first dose. That means sometimes 
uh, in PPM, I have to say that our waiting list is about a year. So and because of the uh, reappointments and now has lengthened to about one and a half years. So we recommend that if they want to uh, proceed with the screening, they can go elsewhere and come back uh, with the results. Uh, the College of Surgeons, Breast and Endocrine Chapter and College of Radiology has uh, come up with uh, our, uh, our uh, recommendations for uh, breast imaging, vaccination and management of lymph node enlargement. So this is uh, available on their website, the CSSM. So this recommendation is aimed to reduce the patient anxiety, actually to reduce healthcare provider anxiety because most of the clinicians are quite concerned with uh, these findings when we report them. So it also reduces the cost of unnecessary burden of imaging and evaluation of the enlarged nodes. So it avoids delay in vaccination. And this is, uh, there are some uh, uh, figures and tables of recommendation that we do uh, display on the website. So this is uh, the algorithm or flowchart of the clinical uh, pathway when we do receive uh, patients with uh, uh, axillary lymphadenopathy. We say here palpable because uh, usually it's, uh, uh, symptomatic, if it's enlarged, sometimes it's painful, that is the uh, usual uh, presentation of this patient. Usually they get it one or two days immediately after vaccination, but it should go off within one or two weeks. So if they have a axillary lymphadenopathy in recent less than six weeks of uh, the same site of the vaccination, if there is no additional clinical findings, that means there's no uh, breast symptoms, no uh, lumps, no swelling, no breast enlargement, uh, and it's an isolated reactive lymphadenopathy. How do we know this is a reactive lymphadenopathy? Uh, uh, it's not hard, it, it's, uh, it's usually uh, painful, but sometimes it's painless and usually goes away. So we see them uh, within six weeks, so they should... Uh, almost disappear or they shouldn't cause any problems. But if there is clinical concern and persists more than six weeks after the final vaccination, this is a second dose. So some uh, mm -hmm. vaccine doses, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> are far apart, sometimes it's 12 weeks, but usually Pfizer is only one month. So it should go away after six weeks of the last dose. If there are other suspicious clinical findings, we have to review the breast, lung, or for other features of lymphoma and other suspicious symptoms and signs. If there are recent cancer patients, so this usually goes to the breast assessment centers. They do not see the uh, primary care health providers and they are seen by the oncologists. And they usually have a, they usually have a routine uh, imaging, sometimes CT scan, PET scan, or MRI. And we do have a complete report and recommendation if we do find any adenopathy concerning uh, vaccine-related uh, swelling. So if there is uh, any problems with the breast, lung, or lymphoma clinically, uh, then we recommend imaging, ultrasound, mammography, or CT scan, and biopsy. This rarely occurs, but if there is a previous cancer, this would be recommended if the uh, lymphadenopathy is difficult to distinguish from uh, breast cancer lymphadenopathy. So I just show some example. This is a left um, uh, MLO mammography. Uh, a is uh, the mammography done after the after the uh, vaccine on the same side uh, of the patient, that means on the left side. If you have a vaccination jab on the right side and the adenopathy is on the left side, uh, it's almost always not going to be related to the vaccine unless the same side is affected. So you have to uh, be concerned if it's on the contralateral side. So this is a patient with a previous right breast cancer. Of course, uh, they, this is something that we have to thoroughly check up. Uh, after uh, one month of the second dose of Moderna uh, in the left desktop muscle, you see here, this is a one year prior mammography that she has these multiple sub-centimeter nodes, but very uh, benign because they are fatty hilum and they are small. But uh, after the uh, vaccine, you see the same lymph node, one of the larger lymph nodes are enlarged and uh, uh, it's quite difficult to see. So naturally, we will do an ultrasound and uh, do further uh, uh, assessment because it's difficult to see. It's just white on the mammography, but we, we should look at the other features. 
So this is another example, young woman, uh, two to three uh, years old, family history of breast cancer. So this is a high risk screening. They do MRI and uh, mammography in alternate uh, six months or one yearly. So this is a baseline uh, high, risk screening, uh, high risk screening MRI. Uh, uh, we have a few, uh, encountered a few of this kind of women where they come for uh, MRI screening, but uh, uh, thankfully uh, uh, patients are, these days are asked routinely whether they had a vaccination. So we have a few, maybe five or six uh, patients who have screening, but with ipsilateral adenopathy and we just follow them up and come back in uh, uh, for clinical review. And one or two of the patients do have a uh, breast cancer, but because we don't know whether the adenopathy or the or the uh, or the uh, leaf nodes are uh, malignant, so they uh, will be uh, subjected to biopsy. And uh, I think the routine clinical practice now, if they are, have breast cancer, uh, the vaccination should not be performed on the same side of the cancer. Uh, 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 breast cancer it should be on the other side of the uh, uh, abnormality. So this is the lymph nodes. It's quite big. You, See, even here, you don't see the lymph node uh, present. These are, these, in this kind of situation, we normally uh, call the patient to come back and do an ultrasound maybe uh, six, uh, six weeks later or at three months before the, before the second dose is up. So this is a, an ultrasound. Uh, we don't normally do ultrasound for every patient who have adenopathy, but only when there is any clinical concern. So this is a lymph node that's a fatty hilum. This is normal. Uh, these are examples of uh, adenopathy that is uh, present in patients who have uh, vaccinated uh, uh, when vaccination, COVID-19 vaccination. Sometimes it's just solitary, sometimes it's multiple. So this should go away uh, after six weeks. So the, the, the keyword is six weeks. Uh, six weeks to eight weeks. So after six weeks, if they are still present clinically, then we will recall them for ultrasound and uh, biopsy if it's indicated. So in both patients, the left axial lymphadenopathy was isolated finding with no abnormality. So given recent COVID-19, we just uh, 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 give a, a conclude that these are benign findings. And uh, if they are any clinical concern, they have to come back for further imaging. So there are some uh, other guidelines in uh, either breast uh, imaging societies. So this is the uh, American uh, College of Radiology. These are the recommendations that they have. Uh, routinely, they uh, avoid the imaging to be done within the uh, uh, post-vaccination uh, period. So it's usually done before or uh, two months after the vaccination. So they recommend this because sometimes patients are very anxious, they want to come back for screening, but these are steps to allay their fears and reduce the burden because once you, re you postpone appointments, you're going to increase burden for the next uh, uh, quarter year of screening time. So this, uh, this is uh, similar to our guideline in the uh, website, uh, but they, uh, they're a bit more... Uh, they're a bit more clinical. This is not just for breast. This is for everything else, for all cancers, lung cancer, for uh, lymphoma, for neck, head and neck cancers, because this can also present with uh, axillary lymphadenopathy. This is another uh, example of uh, society breast imaging. This is a Europe, what they do. Uh, they don't usually uh, use uh, uh, Pfizer. I think they use AstraZeneca, so they don't really have uh, this uh, axillary lymphadenopathy. So there are some other guidelines there, but uh, essentially, I think we have to remember that uh, the vaccination rollout will still be uh, active until probably end of the year. And this is more important for the healthcare providers to be alerted of the uh, incidence of uh, vaccine-related adenopathy and how to deal with the uh, incidence and management. Okay, so these are my references and I would like to thank you for listening to my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Katini. I love the quote on your, you know, the, the thing about traveling and also mammogram. Because that's what I told the patients who refused mammogram. I said, well, you, you like to travel, but you dare not do a mammogram. 
All right, so I'm sure that a lot of people are waiting <laughs> to fly off anytime soon once yes. the border is open. <laughs> I don't mind that radiation. Yeah, <laughs> you don't mind that. Okay, so um, I think due to time restraint, we uh, shall just go through quickly a few questions and answers. So I have three questions here in the chat box, as you can see. The first question, I think, is to Prof. Katini. So when you pass off an asymptomatic potential COVID-19 positive patient, to be investigated by imaging instead of examining them in a clinic. Would you contaminate the radiology machines without them knowing of the risk? I think it's more of the SOP setting, right? Yeah, uh, okay. that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, sorry, uh, I am assuming uh, Chan Ukraine is a medical practitioner? Uh, that's Prof Chan, I think. Oh, Prof Chan. Yes. <laughs> Prof Chan. Prof Chan. Okay, I have to say, you know, our radiology, I, I forgot to put, I wanted to put uh, the the images of our department where we tape is similarly uh, same across the hospital where we make sure that SOP and the social distancing are adhered to. So when queuing, when because these are the actually not so much the radiology machi machines which are the health uh, risk, is the patients and our own staff. So uh, the radiology machines have been uh, have been uh, set up or uh, programmed so that every uh, patient or every examination that have been done, we make sure that they are sanitized before the next patient. I mean, to me personally, in our uh, breast, because that's that's where the areas where most skin touching is occurring. Ultrasound and mammography. Our uh, health pro our uh, mammographers are uh, you know. Um, touching the patient and we have to manipulate for examination. So there's a lot of touching going on, not just the machine, but to the, the staff as well and to other patients when they, uh, they change their clothing. So these are all uh, taken into consideration. Initially, we, we, we didn't know how to deal with this, that I think two years on, these are the lessons that we learned. So we try to reduce uh, exposure, make sure that uh, the, the, the patients are uh, uh, examined, uh, 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 sorry, examined uh, uh, appropriately with uh, SOPs and uh, this social distance in uh, uh, in in practice. So the radiology machines we have uh, even in MRI uh, or CT scan we have the UV sanitizer where we make sure that the area is sanitized before the patients. And even if we have a COVID-19 patients, they're all separated uh, in another room. So I hope that answers. But to us, I think this is all personal, uh, personal prep, personal uh, responsibility. I think everybody should be aware of, I think you should, we should be taking care of ourselves, uh, make sure we double mask up. So even we go to the wherever the uh, examination, if, especially in radiology, because there's a lot of public people, make sure you don't unnecessarily go and socialize with people, just do your examination and get out from that place uh, quickly. Yes, Lee. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for the answer. Okay, the, the second question is actually, I think, aim uh, to the breast surgeons, all right? So the question sounds like this. Are all confirmed cases of breast cancer screened for genetic variants? So maybe I would just start off the a few examples first, and then maybe Maisie can uh, just add on to it. So normally for our newly diagnosed breast cancer patients, we do not actually routinely screen them for um, genetic screening, unless for a certain um, reasons, which are actually listed in our uh, CPG guidelines. For example, if the patient is diagnosed less than 45 years old, or patient has a breast cancer bilaterally, young um, breast cancer patients with um, maybe first degree relatives with both, both breast and ovarian, uh, even uh, male breast cancer in a family or anyone uh, first degree with prostate cancers, uh, pancreatic cancers, uh, which has a little bit link to the genetic uh, of BRCA1 and 2. So um, our genetic panels actually uh, consist of four main uh, genetic uh, testing only, but it does not mean that when it's negative means that you do not have any other pathogenic uh, variant. So maybe Maisie, you would like to add on uh, to, to it a little bit more? Hi, thank you for the question. Um, all breast cancer will have to have a very thorough uh, history taking. 
So we will include specific uh, family history to determine those who are at high risk of genetic uh, disp- uh, predisposition. Uh, so if they have been identified as high genetic risk, then only we, sub- we will advise for genetic testing because genetic testing has to go through genetic counsellor because there are implications uh, from the genetic test results. Thank you. Absolutely true. All right, so I hope this answers the question. So let's move on to the last question of today. Uh, I think this probably has come from the public. I'm not very sure. So there's a debate on giving this third uh, booster dose probably beginning from this month. And the question is regarding the breast cancer patients with low immune uh, that is talking about the white cell count, which drops to 2.3 after the second dose of COVID vaccination. So is it still advisable to take the third dose booster for the COVID vaccination? Uh, maybe Prof. Anita can help with this. Thank you. Thank you, Ling. Thank you for the question. Uh, now, again, uh, I'm not quite sure what context this is because we don't normally check a patient's blood counts after receiving vaccines. But somehow in this particular patient, it was found that her, her blood count dropped to 2.3, which is, yes, it's, it's uh, you know, below the uh, lower uh, level of normal, but not that low, low to be alarming, I would say. Um, and again, I don't know whether this particular patient was actually on chemotherapy, for example. So that's why she was having all this blood tests done. And, and it may be that that 2.3 uh, reading is actually because she's on chemotherapy. But I certainly would say this is not a cause for concern for third uh, booster, if, if, if you ask me personally anyway. So... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, this, is, this is not going to be a contraindication to vaccination because um, not something is just on the guideline as such. So I would still uh, advise this particular patient to have the booster. Uh, in fact, it might be even more important for this patient to have the booster because if you have a fairly low immune system, then you would need that you know, extra protection from COVID-19. That would be my answer. Thank you. Okay, all right. So uh, I think particularly in this case, um, maybe if uh, the patient is worried, um, maybe a repeat test uh, before the vaccination, but it's just a suggestion. There's no guideline to it. All right, sorry, am I still around? Hello? Okay, all right. Yes, you are laying, yeah. Okay, so I think this wraps up our interesting... Sorry. Yes, sorry, anything from Prof. Kat? Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right, or else I think uh, this will be the end uh, of our session today. A great sharing from uh, three specialists and a very informative one indeed. So please join us again for another session of the breakfast at FOM next week, same time, same channel. And bye-bye to everyone. Have a good day and happy pink October. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Ling. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sham. Bye. Thank you.